you can never tell what you're going to find. So you call me as your preacher to go out each week with a script, with scripture as a guide on a scouting mission and check out the lay of the land to discover something of what it's like out there and then to come back on Sunday and report into you. You say to me, we want to go out there on the journey, but before we go, we want you to tell us something of what we can expect. And I, I try to do that. Now, many times what I find is always oh, just so beautiful, streams of mercy, flowers of comfort, butterflies of hope, wings of eagles, rocks of ages. In great day, I cannot wait. I'm just ready to do a wind sprint to get back here on Sunday morning and share it with you. But sometimes I find dangerous territory, even treacherous. I come back to report to you and I look like I've seen a ghost. <laughs> Interesting, and it's just another name for the Holy Spirit is Holy Ghost. Yeah. I report to you, you are not going to believe what I found out there. It's opposite of what I thought. It would change everything. I don't think I want to go back out. You see, I have this physical condition. Maybe you've noticed it in this time we've been together, it's called weak knees. <laughs> Not just because, but just because the preacher shies away from God's story doesn't mean it's not true. So I'm going to report what I found. It's going to be a little bit of a rough ride. Briar and humus Annie Dillard once wrote about church pews and seats and that we should forget about whether they have cushions that are comfortable and instead make sure that they have seat belts. <laughs> You might just want to buckle it. Our scripture is from 1 Corinthians. In this scripture, the apostle has been in a debate with those who say that the basics of the Christian faith are weak and stupid and foolish. And he responds, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. Holy One, be with your servants now and your servant. Let it be that the words that are spoken and the words that are heard are well-pleasing in your sight. And lift us all to a place where we can hear these words of wisdom and foolishness. Amen. Today we ordain and install new officers. Roxanne and Chris and Barb. I celebrate so much and I count as holy and sacred the chance to welcome these three into the ordained leadership of the Apostles' Church with the other officers, Sue and Kay and Sharon. And my instinct is to urge you to employ your greatest wisdom, your greatest strengths to this calling. I want to tell you that the way to succeed as an elder is to rely on your innate common sense, the wisdom that you have accrued through the years of living, the strengths you have developed, and which drew the nominating committee to nominate you and this congregation to elect you to be their leaders. I want to tell you that sound judgment, prudent instincts, and the wisdom born from years of living will lead you into a successful term as officers. That's what I want to tell you. But here's the thing. You sent me out on a scouting mission into the wild world of Scripture, and this is what I found. God has made foolish our wisdom. God has made weakness our strength. What the heck? So officers elect and officers here in worship, we have a choice when confronted with a claim like that. We can, with great certainty, with clarity, 
with a distinguished voice declare, there's something wrong with that scripture. <laughs> or we can imagine that this word is inspired. We can open ourselves to the profundity of the divine paradise. Strength is weakness. Wisdom is foolishness. Weakness is strength. Foolishness is wisdom. You know what this is? This is a reversal. I hate reversals. <laughs> it's, it's when you get everything set in your mind. This has ever happened to you? You build your life around it. And then find the exact opposite is true. Who likes that? Take the idea of strength. Don't we know what that is? I mean, you go to the gym to work out religiously, let us say. Do you do that to get weak? Or the idea of wisdom. You, we know what that is. We have an important decision to make. Financial, let's say, or a career decision, or personal, very important. We're looking for some really solid wisdom. So, do you go and dial up the clown from the service? We know strength and wisdom, like the disciples. They knew strength and wisdom. Things were really popping with Jesus. It's really happening. Things are on the move, and the disciples are they're trying to manage and organize. It's almost like a political campaign. Jesus, time to go over there and meet those people. Now it's time to go back on that side of the town to speak to those. Now over here to do this. Now over there to do that. We can't go there because we don't have time. And the disciples are thinking, you know, I think this is working. We're on a roll here. We're looking better. There have been reporters that have been here. There was an article in the Star Trip just yesterday. Soon we'll be on the evening news with, with Rachel Mack. <laughs> and then someone brings in the little kids. Oh, don't do that, the manager said. We can't have them in here. Don't mess up the flow. Well, I tell you what, I was step on one of them. And now it's crying and the reporters are taking pictures. This whole thing is just a, it's just a bunch of foolishness. We don't have time for that. And Jesus heard that and he stopped everything. And he sat right down on the ground, plopped. The reporters, they're watching, and the photographers are ready. And one of the children has a book, Dr. Seuss, holds it up to Jesus. Jesus says, oh, one fish, two fish. That's just my favorite. I'm so glad. Would you like me to read it to you? <laughs> and you should see it. You know how kittens are around a warm bowl of milk? Just, just all over him. They're ever sitting in his lap, hanging on his shoulder, pulling on his beard, feeling his hair listening to him read, their mouths open in wonder. It's like the most amazing thing they've ever heard. Finally, someone says, what is he doing? <laughs> Jesus looks up, and all the reporters and the big wigs are looking at him, and he says, real wisdom? Real strength? Here it is. And just then, one of the children burps. <laughs> and they all giggle. Jesus smiles and he says, Friends, if you're looking for what I'm about, if you want a glimpse of the world I'm working for, here it is. It's a reversal. But what does it mean? Why is the wisdom of the world foolishness and the strength of the world weakness? Some of you may have heard of Henry Nouwen, a Roman Catholic priest, writer, he had reached the zenith of his career. He had ascended all the way to being a professor at Harvard University. For any academic or theologian at Harvard, that's pretty much the grand prize. He quit. Why would he leave there? To leave Harvard, it must have been really something special, big. He left to become the pastor at a home for severely handicapped children. Wow. Author and activist Jean Vanier was the founder of that community. Listen to the charge that Vanier gave to Henry Nouwen upon his installation as the pastor. May all your expectations be frustrated. 
May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness, that you may experience the powerlessness and the poverty of a child. And then sing and dance in God's love. Friends, this church stands at a crossroads. I have been with you now almost three years. This past Thursday, your session met with representatives of Presbytery who, were, who are responsible for working with and helping churches who are in transition. It was a very, very helpful meeting during which they very clearly laid out the process as we move forward toward the time that you will call your next pastor. Part of that process will involve forming a mission statement that will involve a series of meetings led by the session with the congregation. You will be hearing a lot more about this, but we hope to begin that work sometime this fall. As a sidebar, and I do this because the session knows that you will be interested in the timeline, the overall process. After the mission study, there will be a process of selecting and training a search committee. That will probably be sometime in late spring, perhaps even into the summer. This will be followed by that group, that search committee, writing a document that serves as a sort of church resume that is, that is uh, disseminated in all the different places that pastors in the Presbyterian Church are, 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 are find, trying to find their next call. All of this, I'm sorry, and this will then be followed. After all of that, then they actually get to the search where they're actually meeting people and going to visit and, and all of that. All of this takes care and time. The best estimate of when a new pastor would be called is approximately two to two and a half years from now. So, as we begin to think about that mission study, how do we approach it? Well, after journeying in the wilderness with this scripture, I would like to suggest this is a possibility. It is the truth that the way into a vibrant future is not by our own strength and wisdom but by a strength that seems weak and a wisdom that seems foolish. Now, I by no means dare suggest to you what that looks like in detail. That is the journey that we will be on a discovery together. That is what we will create when that mission study is finished. Rather, what this sermon is claiming is that to get to a place, to be able to open ourselves to help, to truly ask for help takes a conversion, a reversal, a transformation. That's what reversals are. <clears throat> to open us to the deep realization that the structure and nature of reality is that we need help. And that there is a higher power who is near to us and available to us to help. That is faith. Now, you know me by now as a preacher. That's why I mentioned how many sermons we share together. So you know what comes next. <clears throat> Normally it is a story. Right? Yeah. An attempt at some clever, engaging account. Today it would be of someone else trying to look strong and wise, only to end up looking weak and foolish. And that would be well within my comfort zone to talk about somebody else. <laughs> but it also would be untrue to the scripture. So the Holy Ghost that I saw suggests, in no uncertain terms, that the most weak, the most foolish thing I could do right now would be to share this part of my story. In my 20s, I was a I had dropped out of seminary. I had become an agnostic. I had set out on a career path in social work. I had cast off the cloak of dependence and neediness in favor of the strong suit of independence. 
I didn't meet anybody or anything. Just the out of my I put my trust in my own freedom, my own sh wisdom, and my own strength. I was drifting fast down the river of narcissism, oblivious to the precipitous fall, which is at the end of every wild river. I was I was confronted by my wife and by my best friend about the way I was living. The message I heard from them was either wake up or lose everything. One night I was in despair. What I had known and figured out as strength and wisdom had been shown to be empty and vain and as insubstantial as a bunch of empty tin cans. I lay down on my bed in the dark. I thought I was through with prayer. Yet here came these words out of my mouth. I do not know if you are here. I feel like an idiot talking to an empty dark space. But help me. Please. Help me. Something came then. It started as a tingling in my toes. It swept upward through my whole body. To the crown of my head it was a warmth, a presence, and yes, a peace that to this day I can still feel. Friends, I wish I could tell you that from that moment on I never lapsed into to, to, uh, stupidity. <laughs> I can't tell you that. But I can tell you this. There has not been one moment since that time, not one, when I have not been aware of a warm, invading presence that stands ready to claim us, to make our ways of weakness and foolishness into God's own work and miracles of grace. And I believe that if we as a church open ourselves to this presence, confessing our helplessness about how to find a way for 50 years from now, this church to be the beautiful thing it is now, that we if I believe that if we open ourselves to this presence, we will end up, we and our people that come after us, singing and dancing with that power and held tight in the embrace of love. Let us pray. God, help us. We have done the best we know but it feels as if we need more. As we contemplate the future of Apostles Church, as we are here as your new and current officers, as we are here as members of the community, come to us, Holy One. Sweep over us with your holy, freaking, scary spirit and fill us with faith that enables us to trust you, to be vulnerable and weak, to be innocent and foolish to be, in other words, your strength, your wisdom, yes, your followers in this world. Oh God, we need thee 